Greetings. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor Masterclass. Joining us today is Petina Gapa, novelist, playwright, and international trade lawyer. Enjoy this masterclass. Hello. My name is Petina Gapa, and this is my masterclass. My first memories of writing are from the time when I was in primary school. That's when I realized that behind the books that I loved, the adventure stories, the books about horses, about ballet, there was a conscious mind. There was somebody behind it who created the books. So I thought to myself, that could be me. And that's how I started writing. I've written four books so far. Well, I say I've, ri I've written four books, but I've actually written more. Uh, I have uh, destroyed more books than I've published. My first book, this one, An Elegy for Easterly, is a short story collection. It was published in 2009. That's when I became a published author. All the years before that, I had been writing and sometimes destroying manuscripts before anybody could see them because I just didn't have the confidence that I could be the kind of writer that I wanted to be. So this book means a lot to me. It's the worst book I've written, but it means uh, the most because it was the book that gave me a start. I was very surprised at the success of An Elegy for Easterly because it was immediately snapped up by about 10 publishers around the world. And you know it won a couple of uh, prizes. Um, and people really seemed to relate to it. I don't think it's a bad book. I, I don't think it's a bad book. It's just that of all the things that I've written and all the books that I hope to write, I think it's the weakest. So the inspiration for my first book, An Elegy for Easterly, came out of the reality of being Zimbabwean. And what I found disassociative living outside the country is that the country I was reading about and the country that I would see when I came back home seemed to be two different things. And I thought to myself, surely there's a way to make this reality meet the perception. And of course, when you're reading about Zimbabwe from outside, it tends to be what Chimamanda Adichie called a single story. But when you are living in Zimbabwe, that story is part of your reality. But you also have a lot of other things going on. Weddings, falling in love, uh, people fighting over many things, uh, over deceased estates, people fighting you know, in relationships. Uh, there's a lot of joy, welcoming babies, all against the backdrop of a collapsing economy and so on. So I thought to myself, that's the story. That's the story of my Zimbabwe. And that's the story that I want to write. So whenever I talk to young people, especially about writing, I talk from my experience, as well as, of course, from experiences of other writers that I know. And I would say that what is common to most writers is that it starts with an idea. Writing a book starts with an idea. And the idea can come from experience, it can come from observation. It can come from reading. And what, for me, tends to spark a lot of my ideas is experience, memory, observation, sometimes even dreams. You know, I can have a crazy dream and think, wow, that would make a good novel. So then from that idea, I then take it to completion, which is the book. And that's where the hard work is. Because to be inspired, you can be inspired almost daily. But the work of actually producing a book, that's where the real story is. A good example to talk about the inspiration process and how that leads to a novel is my second book, which is the Book of Memory. And the idea for this book came from a newspaper headline. And the newspaper headline was one woman on death row. There was a woman on death row, and she was the only woman in the country on death row. And she was the only woman who had been on death row for some time, actually, because uh, if you know anything about Zimbabwean history, you will know that there's only been one woman hanged in the history of this country, and that was Charwe, the medium of the Nehanda spirit. Uh, the law has always been lenient to women when it comes to the death penalty. So the idea that there was a woman on death row, the only woman on death row, it began to obsess me. And I started thinking, why is this woman on death row? What has she done? There's only one crime I could think of for which a woman would be on death row, and that's murder. Who did she murder? If I were to write about her, 
What's her life? What led you to that moment? What is she doing in prison? What is she thinking about? So then I became really obsessed with this idea of writing about a woman on death row. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized I needed to learn, to learn about what it means to be in Chikurubi prison. So I had so many conversations with former prisoners to just to try and understand the daily routine of life in prison. And I had the privilege of reading this extraordinary book really, really extraordinary book published by um, Weaver Press, edited by Chiesa Msengezi and um, Irene Staunton. It's called A Tragedy of Lives. And these are collections of um, memoir pieces by women who've been in prison, women who've been in prison for, for various crimes. And what really struck me reading this book is that most women end up in prison because of a man. There's always a man somewhere when women commit crimes. And so that gave me the next spark. There's a man behind the murder of my fictitious woman. Who is that man? Is he the victim? Did he commit the crime? And so on and so on and so on. So then I began to flesh out the whole story and I began to write it down. And it took me 33 drafts from conception until completion. I have a lot of people who ask me how to write and I give them a very simple answer. On the surface it seems like a simple answer but I'll break it down. If you want to write, write. Sit down every day and write. The method I use is one that I call the Graham Greene method after the English author who was famous for writing 500 words a day. And th there's a joke that if Graham Greene was in the middle of a sentence and he reached word number 500, he would stop there. So he would say, the man got up to go to the, and then he stops there. And then the next day he picks it up and says, to the back of the garden, right? And what that method does, counting words, writing a specific number every day, is that you push yourself. You push yourself to produce those 500 words or 600, in my case, I try to write a 1,000 words a day. Whatever I'm working on, I try to write a 1,000 words a day. And it doesn't matter whether you're feeling inspired or not. You push it and push it until you have your words. The more words you have, the more of a book emerges. And this is the hardest part of being a writer, producing that first draft. Because after that, it becomes pure joy. That is the essence of writing now. Now we're coming to what in Shona you might call mongo enyaya. That's the marrow of the question. What turns heap of words? What turns it from this, which is a manuscript, right? This is a manuscript of my first draft for my most recent novel, uh, Out of Darkness, uh, Shining Light. And if you zoom into the camera, you will see that it wasn't originally called Out of Darkness, Shining Light. It was called The Last Journey of Dr. Livingston, right? And so this is the first draft that I, that I worked on. Now, the beauty of having a good first draft, no matter how bad you think the words are, no matter how incoherent you think it sounds, is that writing is rewriting. Writing is editing. Writing is polishing. It's sculpting. I have these two wonderful sculptures here, and when I talk about writing, I always use the example of sculpture. Uh, this one is called Caring Husband, and it's by a brilliant artist from Laura called Wellington Mube. And this one is called Smart Man, by another brilliant artist uh, called uh, M. Chuma. Now, these two artists saw a piece of wood, right? And each one saw something individual in that piece of wood. He saw a caring husband holding up his wife, and he saw a smart man possibly who's bought his suit after payday. And to get to that image, they started sculpting, perfecting, until they produced this. And I see writing in a similar way. That first draft is like a piece of wood or a stone that you sculpt and sculpt, that you polish and perfect. You may paint it, giving it a nice title. You may change the paint. So that's how I 
I, I do my process, right? This is how I write. I produce a first draft, as many words as I can, and then I spend a good amount of time, the best amount of time actually, sculpting, rewriting, editing, proofreading, double checking. If I find that the research doesn't add up, I have to change a paragraph. I talk about research a lot in my writing process because research matters to me because of the kind of books that I write. I write the kind of books that are rooted in realism, right? I write realist fiction. And most recently, I've started writing historical fiction. So I've written a book about the African companions of the Scottish explorer David Livingston. Now, how did I imagine myself as the cook in an African expedition carrying a dead body from the interior to the coast of Africa in 1873. There was imagination. I can imagine what it means to be a woman like that, but how did they actually move from place to place? That was research. I read everything I could about Victorian exploration in Africa. I started writing this book in 1998, 10 years after I first came across the story of Chuma and Susi. I only published it in 2018. So it took me 20 years to write one book. And all of that time, I was writing other things, I was doing other things, but I was constantly researching. I went to every single place associated with David Livingstone on the African continent that I could, I could go to. I went to his birthplace, I went to, uh, which has become a museum. And one of the things that makes me extremely happy about the reception of this novel is that during the pandemic, the Livingstone Museum reached out to me and gave me a room a whole room to myself to tell the story of those African companions. I have effectively become an amateur historian, an amateur expert on, on Livingston because I spent so much time working on, it, on, on, on the project and I read everything that I possibly could. So research is really important depending on the kind of story you're writing. There are some stories that may not need as much research, they need more imagination. So if you're writing um, a space adventure set in the year 30, uh, you know, 3,000, you might not need to research as, uh, because it's more of a made up world, right? But if you're writing about a real place, um, and if you're writing about a real person, if you're writing a biography, uh, you need to research a lot. Even if you're writing about your own life, your memory can fail you, right? You probably think that uh, Glenora B was built in 1975, right? when in fact it was maybe built in 1971. So if you're writing a life story that needs research, it's really important that you check and that you get your facts right and that you have an accurate understanding of even your own life. The most incredible thing about writing fiction is creating characters, it, at least it is for me. Creating characters and then creating plots. Plots meaning what actually happens to these characters in the book. Those are the things that I find particularly joyful about writing and especially character building. Now, to give the example of the Book of Memory, I imagined this woman on death row. So the first thing I have to ask is the how questions that you would ask about any, any, any person. How did she get there? But who is she? What does she look like? I needed to visualize her. What does she look like? Who does she remind me of? What does her voice sound like? What are her interests? What, what does she enjoy doing? What does she miss the most about her life in prison? So then I created a woman who was born with albinism because I also wanted to comment about colorism and prejudice in the society of Zimbabwe. So I created this absolutely stunningly beautiful woman with albinism who only discovers she's beautiful when she's outside the society that considers albinism some kind of curse. This is a book that's set in the in the 70s and 60s, so of course attitudes have moved on since then. And then I started to think about what does she enjoy? She enjoys reading, but what is her character? Well, she's actually a very quiet person because when she was in primary school, she got a lot of teasing because of her skin. So I then began to dress or envelope this character with characteristics. To me, character is about creating characteristics. Chinua Achebe had this wonderful gift of creating character. And one lesson that writers can learn from Chinua Achebe is that he tended to give, especially the minor characters, some kind of tick so that you'd remember them. So you'll have a man who has a nervous laugh, or you'll have a man who ha walks with a slight limp. 
you have a man like uh, Okonko's father who doesn't ever put the calabash down because it's always uh, drinking. So you give or clothe your characters with a distinct feature that makes them memorable in the eye of the reader. I talked earlier about how An Elegy for Easterly is uh, not necessarily my least favorite book, but I think my weakest book. But Rotten Row is my favorite book. And the interesting thing about Rotten Row is that it's the only one of my books that hasn't won an award. And yet I think it is the best work that I've produced so far. And the reason I think it's the best work that I've produced so far uh, is because I wrote it for myself. None of my uh, publishing team knew it was coming, not my agent, not anyone. It just landed one Christmas. And it took me 18 months to write. That's the shortest I've ever written a book because it was just pure joy to write. What it is is that I wanted to write a commentary about the criminal justice system in Zimbabwe. But again, because I'm not interested in the single story, I'm not interested in hectoring, I'm, I don't write pamphlets. I don't write political manifestos, I write stories. I wanted to talk about the criminal justice system from all facets. So not only what is done to the people of Zimbabwe by the state, but also what the people of Zimbabwe do to each other. One of my favorite characters, and this is one that my son really loves, is called Copacabana, Copacabana, Copacabana. And it's told from the perspective of a windy who ends up uh, in a very precarious situation. So I did my, my usual research uh, because it's a story that happens in real time. It happens in 23 minutes on a trip from Chisipiti to, to Copacabana. So to time everything that happens, I spent a week just going up and down in combis uh, tr trying to, to get the timing right. And what I love about that story is that it's about humans being human in a very unpleasant way to each other. And that's what a lot of the stories in Rotten Row are about. They're about crime, the consequences of crime, who commits crimes, why do people commit crimes. They're also about the, the law enforcers, about judges, about magistrates, about the police. So my, my take uh, it, on Zimbabwe in Rotten Row was I wanted to look at Zimbabwe through the lens of crime. And that's really what strings all of the stories together. And that's why, to me, it's my favorite book. It's my most coherent book. And each one of my books is fired by different music, right? Rotten Row is fired by the music of the young, right? It's Jar Praiser. It's Toki Vibes. It's Urban Grooves. It's Sniper Storm. It's Gaspy Warrior. So it was also a way for me to connect with that music. Um, whereas the Book of Memory, being set in the 70s and 80s, is inspired by country music. I grew up in Glenora Township, and everybody listened to country music. So country music weaves its way through it. And then when my character Memory is in prison, uh, there's a lot of apostolic faith style a cappella singing in prison, as I discovered. So that also comes into it. And an elegy for Italy being set in the early 80s is all Bundu boys, Oliver Mtukuzi, Thomas Mapumo. And the last one, Out of Darkness Shining Light, because it's set in 1873, I had to find music that could have existed in 1873. So of course I went to the Mbira, which has existed for a very long time. You know, one of the dilemmas of being a writer is the relationship you have with your own work as opposed to the relationship that work then has out there in the world. And as a writer, you need to separate those two things. Uh, you can have a not so good book that wins a thousand awards. And you can have a brilliant book that doesn't win any awards. You have to understand that the reception of your work is a separate thing to the creation of the work. 
So you can have a book that you think is absolutely amazing, um, but the world doesn't see it in, in the same way that you see it. But it shouldn't be something that discourages you or stops you from, from continuing. Because each book has its own alchemy. It has its own relationship when it goes out into the world, right? So the fact that Rotten Row is my favorite book and is a book that I think I wrote, I, I wrote it with, with every fiber of my being on fire, really. The fact that it hasn't been as translated as the other three and the fact that it hasn't had as big an impact doesn't matter to me because to me, the creation of that book is what made me the writer who's going to get to the next level. I always say that um, an analogy for Italy in the Book of Memory were my apprenticeship. Those were my apprentice books. My first short story collection and my first novel. Rotten Row is journeyman level. Rotten Row and Out of Darkness, I'm a journeyman. I'm not yet a master. I want to get better with each book. So to me, in the process of creation, I have to think about what does this book mean to me in terms of how it makes me a better writer and not just about how is it received in the world. It's very tempting to write a book that you think the market wants, that readers want, or that publishers can sell. I had a crisis of faith when I was writing my second book because an elegy for Easterly was so ridiculously successful in terms of how it was received, the critical acclaim, the wonderful reviews, but a lot of it was I, th I was very suspicious of why it was received that way. Because of course I wrote it in 2008, it came out in 2009 and Zimbabwe was in the news. And I had interviews where people would talk about a book about Robert Gabriel Mugabe's Zimbabwe, you know, that sort of thing. And I became very suspicious, is it about me or is it about my country? Is it because I'm telling a narrative that some people want to hear? So I became very self-conscious about myself as a writer because I, I began to ask myself, what kind of a writer am I? As I said, I don't want to be a pamphleteer. I don't want to be, you know, waving messages and all the rest of it. So I had a crisis of faith and I decided to write a book that had nothing to do with the politics of, of the country because I wanted to see what that might look like out there in the world. And that's why the Book of Memory is the story of a woman who's in prison. Uh, she's on death row. It's a family story. And that's when I cracked it and I realized it's about the story, not necessarily the setting. Young authors often face a crisis of faith after publishing the first book because what we call the sophomore, you know, the second time around, the sophomore book is the hardest to write because now you are doubting yourself. If the, if the book is not a success, you think you are not a success. But even when the book is a success, like my book was a success, you start to ask, but is it successful for the right reasons? So it can really lead to a crisis of faith if you don't persevere enough. And what I always say to young writers who have been awarded um, a contract to publish is that it takes a year, right, if you're going to go with mainstream publishing, right? It takes a year to publish a book. So you submit it in June, it comes out maybe in November. During that year, when you're doing the tinkering, when you're doing the polishing, when you're choosing the cover, preparing the publicity, write the next book. Always try to write your next book before the first one comes out because that is what will help you over, get over uh, you know, this crisis of faith when the book is either a success or it's not a success. So always keep busy, always keep writing, always keep counting those 500 to 1,000 words a day. There are two parts to publishing. Right. And I'm talking about publishing now as opposed to writing. Because you have to understand that the two are completely different. When you're writing, you're on your own, in your room, you and the desk and the blank page or the blank screen, knocking out those words every day, polishing and so on. Then when your manuscript is ready, right, when you then have a manuscript, you then try to have it published. And depending on what you've written, you can try and get a mainstream publisher, a commercial publisher, who will offer you a contract under which you earn royalties for the work. So you license the work to a publisher, and in return, they give you a royalty. Uh, royalties tend to be between 
7% and 12% thereabouts, depending on the territory. Some are more generous than others. Now, the idea of the publisher is that you are an investment. So they have invested in you by buying your book, by giving you royalties. If you are really lucky, you get something called an advance which is an advance on royalty. So they sort of anticipate how much your book is likely to earn, and then they give you that advance in, in, so they give you the money in advance. Now, it sounds like a great thing, but actually it's not a great thing because you have to earn your advance, right? And if it's a very large advance and your book doesn't sell so well, you get royalty statements you know, every year or so, and there's a, two horrible words at the bottom unearned advance. So it sh shows you how much money you are still to make for, 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 for the publisher. But there's another path to publishing if you don't want to go uh, with mainstream publishing. Because of course the, the thing about mainstream publishing is it's very difficult to get a publishing contract if you don't have an agent. So there you need an agent who gets a commission for selling your work uh, to the publisher. But if you don't want to go with mainstream publishing and you're happy to write um, a book that circulates you know, in a smaller way, you can also do self-publishing. You can find uh, a lot of companies that do self-publishing. I know Amazon has got a great uh, self-publishing program. Uh, there are companies that offer what's called print-on-demand. So they'll, you, you'll have a contract that says you publish 3,000 books, 2,000 books. And one of my favorite uh, books, Township Girls, which came out recently, about life in the townships in the 70s is a self-published book that has done extremely well because of the energy of the authors to push it and you know, to, to get it um, uh, circulating. But of course, the advantage of mainstream publishing, apart from the fact that you earn royalties, is that all the hard work of marketing, proof editing, copy editing, that's all done for you. Whereas if you're going the self-publishing route, you have to do all of that yourself. Then of course, a question that a lot of writers ask themselves is, can I survive on my writing? And with very great regret, I have to say that not all writers are going to be able to live on their writing. The, the industry just is, is just not possible, especially if you write uh, the kind of books that are called literary fiction, right? Literary fiction simply means the kind of books that you study in school. Right, as opposed to commercial fiction, which is um, you know the book that you read um, on your holiday at Christmas or you know in, in your summer holidays and so on, you know crime thrillers and so on. Those sell a lot and they sell well, but the kind of books that are really about what I call penetrating the heart of the human condition, those books tend not to sell as well as commercial uh, fiction, and yet those are the books that we need. Those are the writers that I think we need. Of course, we need commercial literature as well because it's fun. But uh, Stephen King, for instance, he will publish a book and you know, it, it will sell a million copies. My friend Paula Hawkins, the girl on the train, wonderful, wonderful commercial um, writer, she publishes a book and it sells a gazillion copies around the world. But for the smaller books, the literary fiction, they don't sell as much. So for writers of literary fiction, writers of poetry, writers of plays, it's not always possible to have writing as a full-time job, which is why a lot of writers do other things. I would say about possibly 10% of all writers are able to live on their income from writing. But for the rest, you, uh, writers tend to teach. You know, writing and teaching are, are very closely related. Writers tend to, you know, to do as many other things as, as they can. And some are actually professionals in other fields. You know, I'm a lawyer, um, and that's my, my trained profession. Uh, others are accountants. You know, I've got a very good friend from India um, who wrote Slumdog Millionaire, you know, Vikas Warup, who's a diplomat. You know, um, I've got another friend who's an MP in India as well, and he's, he writes, um, is uh, non-fiction. So th there are many ways that you can try to balance your everyday professional life with writing.
one of the ways that a writer can earn more from their writing is if their work is adapted for the screen, for the screen or for television. You know, if your book is picked up by Netflix, I've got a friend called Lola Shonein from Nigeria, and her book, which is just absolutely wonderful, called The Secret Lives of Babasegi's Wives, is about a man with six wives in Nigeria, and she goes into the interiority of the lives of each of the wives, right? Sort of like looking at polygamy from the woman's perspective. That's been picked up now by Netflix, and it's going to be um, on, on TV, I think, next year. And that's, that's just a wonderful thing for a writer. If you can have your work traverse from the page to the screen, um, I've got another friend who unfortunately passed away a few, um, a few weeks ago, B. Bandele, he was a phenomenal, phenomenal filmmaker. He adapted Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's Half of a Yellow Sun, and it was turned into a film. And he was in Lagos when he passed away. He was adapting Wole Shoinka's famous play, Death and the King's Horseman. So he was adapting that again for Netflix. So if you are fortunate enough to have your book turned into a film or a series, that is something that uh, not only makes your work travel further and people re rediscover the source material, but it's also something that, that can you know, earn, uh, earn income. In my particular case, I've had one story from an elegy for Easterly uh, turned into a film. By um, It was part of a British Council project to train filmmakers, and I loved it because an experienced director was matched with an inexperienced director, cinematographer with an inexperienced cinematographer, and then I wrote, I, I, I wrote the script, and uh, we had some wonderful, wonderful performances. Uh, Munyachi Zonga, you know, he was absolutely wonderful. Michael Kunakwashe, who's one of my favorite per people to work with. And that was a, a really great pro project, but it wasn't a commercial venture. But it was lovely to see how a story that I wrote can actually translate in, into the screen. And I've also written two plays based on my own work. So they haven't been adopted by anybody else, but I have done that myself. Because I wanted to, because I love dialogue, I love the way Zimbabweans speak. So I wanted to see what, you know, the words that I write would sound like on stage. And that has been something that has actually created a second kind of writing life for me, which is that now I am a playwright. I've written a third play about Dambuzo Marechera, about the banning of his novel, Black Sunlight. And I've, uh, I'm also now writing a, a play for school children called That Is That. And if you're a Zimbabwean, you know how that saying finishes. That is that says that if I'm boarding. So it's a play that's set at a boarding school and it teaches children about constitutional rights and responsibilities. So whenever people ask me, how do I get started with writing? How do I continue uh, writing when I'm working on a project? How do I continue to be inspired? I always share with them the eight rules that apply to my own writing life that some writers and people who are aspiring to write might find interesting and helpful. The first rule is that ideas come from within, but they are inspired by what you observe and what you experience without. So there's a relationship between interiority, the internal lived experience of any person, and what you see and what you've experienced. And that's where ideas come from. So every experience from the tragic to the traumatic, mundane, everyday experiences can give you an idea. So you need to open yourself up to receiving those ideas. The second writing rule comes from one of my favorite Christian songs, It Only Takes a Spark. It only takes a spark to get a fire going. That spark, that sliver, hold on to it. Just any idea that you have, just that little spark, it can come from observation, a dream. It can come from an encounter, a memory, an experience, a rumor, reading something else. But once that spark enters your head, write it down. I move around everywhere I go, I move around with a notebook. I have, I think, probably more than 100 notebooks now, right? And I dedicate a notebook for each project, but I also have just general little notebooks for any ideas that come to me. Write it down. And if you're not a notebook person, especially the young generation, use your phone. Use the voice note function on your phone to write something or, or to, to um, record something. Use the note function on your phone because that's, you need a storage, a vault for all your ideas. The third thing that I would say is that, yes, it takes a spark. It takes a spark to get a fire going. 
but it takes tending to make sure that the fire warms and it goes and it cooks. And that tending is the everyday work that you do once you have that idea. That tending is to write every day. Commit to counting words every day. And this is the hardest part. But if you do it consistently enough, you find that after three, four, five months, you have a draft. That leads us to writing rule number four, which is polish and sculpt until the thing that you see in your mind becomes the thing that you see in reality. From manuscript to finished product, right? First draft to this. This is only possible because of the sculpting of the many drafts that I discarded, that I you know, perfected over the years. So don't give up. Keep going. Now, rule number five, proof read your work. Proof read your work because you want your work to be published. So you want your work to be the best that it can be. And when you've finished your first draft, you're polishing, you're polishing, sometimes it helps to take a distance from your work, right? Put it away, focus on something else, and come back to it with fresh eyes. But the best thing that you can do for yourself is to find what I call first readers. Find first readers who will read your work, who will give you honest criticism. I used to criticize manuscripts, uh, write young writers' manuscripts, until I realized that actually young writers tend to want praise. They don't really want honest criticism. But if you really want to be the best writer you can be, you should be open to criticism. You should be open to people you trust reading it and saying, you know what, you may want to improve this, you may want to work on that. The sixth rule is pay attention to grammar. I'm known as a bit of a grammar pedant, right? especially on Twitter, um, but pay attention to grammar because grammar matters because grammar isn't just a formal thing that you learn in school. Grammar is a mediator of communication. Getting words right matters. One of my favorite typos in newspapers is when people talk about a secular, circular society, meaning round, society circle, when they want to say secular society, right? Or thumbs up when they want to say thumbs up, you know. But little things like that can actually distract the reader. So it's important to get your grammar right, to get your syntax right. Syntax is about how sentences sound, to get your, your spellings right. The seventh rule, I would say, especially if you're writing the kind of nonfiction, I have some wonderful nonfiction books here, uh, a wonderful uh, biography of cancer called The Emperor of Maladies, you know, how cancer uh, affects the human body and what is being done to cure cancer. This took a lot of research. It was written by a wonderful doctor called Siddhartha Mukherjee. And this book by um, Nandan Nelakani, who's an Indian tech billionaire, is uh, imagining India. H you know, what to, how to get India right, right? And then I also have a, a brilliant book here called Nkone Cattle of Zimbabwe, a book about Zimbabwean cows. And one of my favorite books, and I hope somebody does something similar, in Zim is churches, the history of churches, you know, how different churches came to be built. It would be wonderful to do a, a, a book like that. But if you're going to write this kind of book, you really need to be accurate, you need to do your research, and you need to make sure that in your nonfiction, you are absolutely, absolutely a slave to, to accuracy. And then the eighth rule of writing is perhaps the most important. A writer is a person who reads. There is no way to become any kind of writer without being a reader. And I cannot emphasize this enough. You cannot write without reading. Because writing comes from a love for words. It comes out of a love for language, engagement with the written word. And what is the best way to engage with the written word? Is to read. You know, we often ask ourselves, you know, when I'm with my writing friends, if you had a choice between never being able to write or never being able to read, what would you choose? And we all say, well, it's, it would be very heartbreaking to never have to write again, but I would rather give up that than not being able to read. So if you are a writer or you want to be a writer, read as much as you can. Read not only for your own entertainment and enjoyment, read for inspiration. Read because it helps you become a better writer. It's the ultimate masterclass, 
reading the works of others, reading the works of writers you admire, uh, reading the work of uh, writers that you can, you can learn from. And part of the reading can also mean research. If you need to research, take your time to research. But above all, read, read, read. I wanted to be a writer before I wanted to be anything else. I wanted to be a writer and I wanted to be an explorer traveling to find the source of the Nile. I didn't realize it had been found. Um, then I wanted to be a ballerina and a vet and all that kind of thing. But I have to say that the formative years for me as a writer came from my experience of going to three different law schools, right? Because each different law school taught me how to write in a different way. And then after law school, of course, I started working. And I, I worked in, at the WTO at a place called the Appellate Body, which was a tribunal uh, resolving trade disputes. And what I learned there about writing, how to write with clarity, with precision, how to write complex ideas for a non-specialist audience, those are tools that I have taken to my own writing. I am obsessed with detail to the point where I cannot read a book after it's been published because I'm terrified I'm going to find something that I missed. You know, so the kind of lawyer that, uh, that I am, you know, really paying attention to detail has turned me into the kind of writer that I am. I've always been passionate about libraries because that's where I became a writer. And I'm actually writing a memoir and you will have a sneak peek at the title. My book is called Heaven is a Library. And it's about the 10 libraries that formed me as a writer, as a lawyer, and as a thinker. So I start with the library at primary school, which was called the Queen Victoria Memorial Library, which became the Harare City Library. And so when I found it collapsed and dilapidated, I decided I'm going to do something about it. And that became my passion for, um, for library. I also worked with the Chikrubi Prison Library with a group of wonderful women to capacitate the Chikrubi Prison Library uh, because when you're in prison, you have very little to do. So we decided to capacitate uh, the library, both for the prisoners and for the prison guards. So that was another fun project. And my next project uh, is to assist the annex, Pararenyatwa annex, um, to also have uh, a really good library for, pay for, inpatient, for pay inpatients and, out and outpatients. Uh, because when you are in a, a mental institution, again, it can very get very lonely. So those are the the three libraries that I've, I've, I've worked with and that I intend to work with. And um, I can't go into detail because we're going to launch it formally next year, but um, we are setting up a family foundation to support education, the arts, and enterprise, you know, small, small business people, small business uh, women and s youth in business because we want to honor the memory of um, my late father and my late brother. So it's going to be a project that celebrates the very best of my brother and my father by investing in the kind of uh, things that they were passionate about. So I want to recommend five books that I think every writer can learn from, in particular because they have been incredibly helpful to me uh, in raising my own writing. The first one, is a memoir, one of the best memoirs by a politician, uh, and that's Barack Obama, Dreams of My Father. A lyrical, lyrical book that I think every writer can learn from. The second book in the, what I would call, How to Write Properly About Africa section, is uh, Thomas Pakenham's The Scramble for Africa, and truly magisterial work of history, explaining how Africa came to be colonized, and it's, it's just a wonderful, wonderful book, lively, elegant, funny even. It's got a lot of humor. And the third book that I would recommend, especially for writers who want to learn how to write nonfiction and how to research, is this absolutely wonderful biography of cancer that I can't read enough times called The Emperor of All Maladies, which is by Siddhartha Mukherjee, who's a, a doctor who, who's from India, who works in, um, in the United States. I also want to recommend a book that I want to actually hold up, uh, which is called Mothers of the Revolution. It was edited by Irene Staunton, who is a publisher at Weaver Press, and it's the liberation struggle from the perspective of women, from the perspective of uh, women who fought the liberation struggle, because normally we hear of the fathers of the revolution. 
And finally, um, if I were to read only one book, which is not the Bible, if I were to read only one book, uh, it would be Homer. It would be, actually I'm going to cheat and say it would be the Iliad and the Odyssey because that's the first real novel in the European tradition and it's the, it's the novel from which so much inspiration has come. You know, if, if you're a fan of Game of Thrones, you know, <laughs> wait until you read Homer. It will blow your, it'll blow your mind away. Um, so those are the books that I would, I would recommend as books that every writer can learn from. <laughs> Wow, that, that was a powerful masterclass from uh, Petina Gapa. Insightful, inspirational, and informative. So many takeaways. But I'm not going to dilute things. I think the her eight rules uh, to writing, for me, are the biggest takeaway from here. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed it. If you did, remember to subscribe, to like, to share, and to go to our website. Until the next masterclass, Cheers to you all.